All right, so hey, hey everybody, Carl Epiglesi here. I like to keep it um, informal. I've been um, with data, uh, with IBM for a few years now. Um, prior, I used to work for a company where I was director of innovation, so I've always dealt with emerging technologies and trends. Um, my focus at IBM is uh, I'm the global data science and big data evangelist for our platforms and our tools. So I'm gonna cover for you a little bit about um, things that are emerging in the space around data science, the particularly how the, the team approach. Apache Spark, I'll go in pretty deep why Apache Spark's important in the ecosystem of open source tools versus uh, tools out in the space for data science. And then uh, at the end, I'll give you a quick demo. So how many people here actually understand, like we know Apache Spark pretty well, um, or deep with it at all? Hands-on coding, Python developers at all? A little bit, okay, cool. And um, any R developers or data scientists in the room? Okay, good, this will be a good talk for you guys then. I was worried about getting too high level. I didn't wanna to go too deep. So, um, well, first, you know, I, I talk to clients all the time. I meet with large, big clients and everybody's faced the same problem. You know, we live in a digital age and you know, you guys know this, but everything we do, uh, we live, play, learn, and you know everything's digitally now. And so the way customers are being handled, and the way companies are dealing with the digital uh, evolution is is different for each company. I mean, we I work with companies uh, uh, such as you know large banks, you know Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, and these guys are going deep into data science and they're transforming their businesses. But still, their main money is based on banking. But everybody's faced with how do they innovate and how do they keep up in, in today's market. Um, and, and so we did a recently a business Harvard, a, a Harvard Business Review recently came together and it said that 72% of, of companies are vulnerable to disruption from uh, digital businesses. So digital businesses are disrupting industries. I mean, you see it with the Ubers and so on, but it's happening, it's real. And um, so it's all being done with data science in, in application development. So that's kind of my, my thing that I'm gonna go into here. However, data-driven organizations are really built around a team. Data science is really a team sport. And we at IBM have focused in on trying to um, enable these, these, these four personas as well as the chief data officer. Um, the data scientist is at the core. This is the person that builds your models, your algorithms, does discovery work, figure out new business models. The business analyst is the person that's kind of got the business expertise, and they're the ones that are kind of identifying opportunities that could be uh, uh, come available based on your data. The data engineer is really that guy that's, you know, you deal with a lot, the DBA type who's got all the data, don't want to let go of it. <laughs> I'm more of a developer type myself, but the data engineer is still relevant, you know, um, and their job is really bringing in that data, making sure it's secure, all the things that the developers typically don't want to deal with. And then the application developer is really the true one that's kind of putting that in the hands of your customers and building the applications. However, in this time right now, there's really a shortage of data scientists because the data scientist seems to be the, the go-to persona or person for all these problems we're trying to solve, what the reality is, is we're really just trying to solve putting data science into our applications. And um, so, so a lot of companies are, are having data scientists be assigned in silos, and they're doing discovery, data modeling, and development. Uh, and then they work with the engineers, developers, and data analysts. For them to be truly productive, there's a lot of draw there. And so what I want to talk to you a little bit about is, is how that particular role is becoming um, uh, really uh, a difficult job in, in the tools that are in the space and, and why Apache Spark is kind of changing that a bit and why the application developer will become more relevant um, in this role. So really like what is a data scientist? And uh, a data scientist, um, I always talk about, they, they have three, uh, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, I got three hoodies here, IBM Spark hoodies. So whoever asks questions first gets a hoodie. And I only got, I got a medium, uh, large, and extra large. Just so you know, one each. <laughs> so if you have a question, interrupt me. But a, a data scientist uh, really has three main uh, skills. And, and, and this comes together with, you have the statistical side, the statistician, they understand their algorithms, they understand statistics. Um, then there's the domain expertise. This is really the understanding the domain you're in, the business problem, and the challenge you're trying to address. 
and then the, the programming skills or the computer science skills. Um, there's no real one person that has all three of these. You know, that's why data science is kind of a team sport, and we see this in big companies. We have some guys that are they're, they're pure mathematicians, and they're, they're very good at data scientists. They also maybe can understand the domain, but they may not be as deep in, in the coding side of things. But then you have people that are more coders, data, you know, developers, who understand the other two or domain expertise, but they don't, they, you know, so, so data scientists could fall anywhere in this diagram, um, and, it, and it's kind of what makes up a data scientist. Uh, data science tools. So Gardner recently came out with the Magic Quadrant, and, you know, I, I know IBM's up there, so it's a shameless plug, but if you see, it's like they're all big vendors, guys that make a profit, but there's no open source tools here. So my point here is to really talk about Managed platforms are provided by, there's a variety of tools and there's a variety of approaches that were, are being solved. IBM, obviously we have our SPSS product that's quite mature, but we're also embracing open source is what really I wanna cover in this talk. But if you look on Google Trends, this is not market share, but you'll see that if you put, and Gardner doesn't put open source against managed platforms, they just don't do that. But if you, if you put Google Trends and, and you'll see the interest, the open source uh, community with Python and R is, is grown considerably. Now, uh, SPSS and SAS really has managed platforms that are out there and that have quite a bit of market share, but you'll see there's a ton of people using the open source technology. And Scala as well is kind of low because it's a niche area, but but a lot of people who help in Scholar doing data science work. Any questions so far? All right. Yes? Do you know what the market share of open source would be if you were to compare it to some of those commercial players? Uh, you know, that's a great question. There's really no data on, that I know of on that. Uh, I know there was recently a great blog out there with one of the analysts who compared the Gardner report that just came out in February with all the open source. And there's nobody, there's, I, I, I think there's gonna be work done to that, but, um, but they really break it down based on managed tools by vendors and open source is kind of separate. So I don't know that for sure. I would think open source has a big market share too, or maybe more. But IBM tells me we have a good market share. I'm sure SAS tells the other guys they got a good market share. <laughs> and then, yeah. <laughs> well, Gardner is independent, so can't really buy those guys, from what I hear. <laughs> hey, that was a question. You want a Spark hoodie with IBM logo on it? Sure. What size? Uh, oh, it's the last large. Let me see here. It's not for sale? It's not for sale. Oh, okay. You can't sell this. If you sell it, you got to split it with me. There you go. Yeah, any I got two more guys. I want to like to get them out. I got something at home I want to get rid of. So um, here's the open source ecosystem that um, I talk about this all the time. And, and you know, for if you're looking for a job, seriously, and making good money, learn big data, learn Apache Spark, learn you know, you can go either to R path or to Python path. I recommend Python. I particularly like Python better, but I'm the programmer. A lot of stat stat guys like are but there's a if you i did a search out and i didn't put a chart up for this but i did a search out on i think it's indeed or somewhere in in you know searching terms in, in these these data science roles they're hiring like crazy everywhere i go there's a shortage of them and these are the skill sets that are really coming together well and even at ibm our tool sets are really being built around these technologies so um just kind of a heads up but if you look at python you'll see Everybody here familiar with Jupyter Notebooks at all? Okay, good, then my demo's gonna be really well put. So, so Jupyter Notebooks, it's uh, an interface that allows you to do Python development, uh, which works well with Spark, PySpark, which we're gonna get into more depth around what Apache Spark is. You know, Python's obviously a language, and then SkyKit Learn, which is a machine learning capability, as well as the machine learning capability in Spark, really are a, a good combination of tools that, that give you the, um, Ability to create some predictive models. And then R, um, you got R Studio and Shiny. Shiny is a great visualization dashboard tool, if you're familiar with it. They all complement each other really well, and I'll give you a demo of what that looks like. So Apache Spark, I'm gonna be very heavy on Apache Spark here because this is ApacheCon, but we, um, 
for, for, for folks that don't know or folks that do know, but Apache Spark is an in-memory application um, uh, framework for distributed computing. And, you know, and, and you know, a lot of people, for iterative analysis on massive data, I forgot that, but a lot of people think of Spark the same as Hadoop, but it's, it's really not. I, if you, if familiar, anybody familiar with Hadoop, what Hadoop is? So Hadoop's really a two-headed coin. It's got a, a compute engine, and it, as well, it's got a distributed file system. And so they kind of work together. With Spark, it's really that compute engine. That's all it is. Um, I mean, it's a lot, but it doesn't have the storage layer. And there's a reason for that. And, and we consider it, we call it our analytic operating system. At IBM, we embrace Spark quite a bit, and we're investing in Spark a lot. But it's a analytic uh, application framework that does computation on the fly, uh, and it, it scales out endlessly, obviously, it's distributed. There's no limits. If I rambled that one on pretty bad. So Spark's really hot. I mean, it's one of the top uh, projects, active, uh, active open source projects. Um, if you look at compared to Kafka and Storm and, and Flink and some of the other ones, there's uh, way more uh, contributions and commits. So there's a lot of activity going on with Spark. And there's a reason. I don't know why this is. There's a reason. Apache Spark, if you look at MapReduce, to write a simple word count with MapReduce took tons of lines of code. You know, it's like maybe 100 lines of code. With Spark, it's really three lines of code. And it's just, it simplified the development uh, against big data so much more, and it's, it's so much faster. That's the reason there's so much interest in it, and I'm going to explain why. So here, just a high-level overview. Is anybody familiar with this slide at all? So this is Apache Spark. Um, I'm supposed to stay by this microphone, but I, want, I like to wander. This uh, particular architecture kind of talks about how what Apache Spark is. So th there's really it's got a set of API layers that that sit on top of a core compute engine. The core compute engine um, is is quite sophisticated. It's much better than MapReduce. Um, it uses a, a thing called a, a, a cyclical a critical graph. It's a graph that manages all the transformations so that when you run, you have two types of actions that could happen in your compute engine. You could have a transformation or an action. So every transformation, it keeps track in a graph. And then at the end, when you hit a, an action, it'll do them all together as one computation. So it's much faster to MapReduce, which spills back and forth to disk. Um, I always tell the, the story of, if you have a file that has a million rows in it, and then the next line of code says, just sum up the numbers for the first 100 rows, why does it have to load that whole thing into memory and then wait for the next action? So it kind of waits and does it all together, so it knows I just need to read the first 100 rows and we'll give you back your results. So it's, it's a better way of doing distributed computing, and it's, it's, it's very powerful. And the next thing that's great about Spark it's got a variety of APIs which are all part of the same project. So if you look at Hadoop, it's an ecosystem of projects. You got Hive, one project. You got you know, MapReduce, another project. You got another project for Storm, which is a streaming. With Spark, you have Spark SQL built in. You have Streaming, which is built in. DStreams is the API. You have machine learning capabilities, MLlib, which is what I'm going to be digging into in this session. And then you got graph capabilities. And then it doesn't matter, so companies have a variety of data stores, so you don't really need to care about what data store you use. You don't have to just use HDFS. You can use a variety of data stores, whether it's public you know, on the cloud or it's on-prem, it works with all of them together. So you can pull a lot of jobs that I do. I pull data from you know, a relational data warehouse and then I'll supplement with just a file on a distributed file system or, or I can put it in S3 or something and then put them together and do some analysis on the fly. So it's quite powerful. Any questions on the architecture? Spark? Can you just merge data with, like if you want to merge data with an S3 file? It goes into, so Spark has a cluster, just like Hadoop. So you, you install Spark on a cluster, and it has uh, tasks and executors that run on, on a bunch of nodes. And so the data will be pulled into memory. And if it doesn't have enough memory, it'll spill over into some disk. So it does some disk. And based on that memory, are, is it only for one query? Like Just for the scope of the, the, the driver application. Okay. So when you initiate, when you create a Spark context, 
it'll know, it'll keep, it'll be aware of the application that's telling it what to do. And that Spark context, when it makes a query, which pulls the data from different sources, it'll create connectors into those sources, pull that data into memory, run the computations or iterate through it, and then give back the result to that application. Does that make, that's a really good question. What size, you want medium or extra large? Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna throw it. Good job. <laughs> and uh, so that's a really good question. And then so Spark is, is, is it big part of the big data ecosystem, but um, it's really more, for me, I, I see it more as application development um, paradigm. Any other questions? Uh, could you use it against like a traditional database as well? Yeah. You should get the last one. I, I, I don't, I don't you don't want it? It's <laughs> extra large for us fat guys. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Anybody that's bigger want to ask? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. So uh, <laughs> now nobody's going to speak. And like, I'm not bigger. <laughs> I'll just keep it myself. It's just too hot in Miami. No. Um, but yeah, you can use any data source. I mean, there's connectors. So some connectors are optimized. So uh, if you have a distributed data source, for example, S3 is distributed. And the connector from Spark to S3 can co-locate based on, you know, compute and processing. Well, HDFS is like that. I know our object store is like that. So, so some connectors are, are smart enough to know to put some computation with the location of where the data persists, if that makes, if you understand what I mean. But so um, it just depends on the connectors. But some connectors to like relational data warehouses will go through one node, which may, may have a bottleneck depending on the size of your data. But, but Spark's really good for machine learning application that doesn't really mean you have to have big data. And I always talk to some of the SPSS people and stuff, and they're like, oh, man, I got a million rows to deal with. And I'm like, well, for Spark, a million rows is not a big deal at all, even just through if it's pulling through, connected through one node. So it's quite, qu quite interesting. It's very different than your traditional way of thinking, and, it, and it's quite powerful. Good question. The other thing that works well with Apache Spark is the open source notebook. So notebooks, you know, years ago people used to use pen and paper. They'd have a thought, a formula, they'd write it down. They'd write numbers down and put the results. Now it's all done in a browser-based application. So it's a way of basically writing a line of code to, to request some information. It pulls it back. You see it. You visualize it. Then you can compute, you know, do more computations on that and kind of iterate in a notebook style where you're just thinking thought to computer back and forth. And, and it's a really interesting um, um, way of data scientists working. And, and I'm also very good for developers as well. And, and I'll show you a demo what that looks like. The Spark, Spark supports multiple programming languages. So you can, you can inter interact with Spark, whether it's... Uh, Somebody turn the lights off. I think you're good. Okay. Whether it's um, um, Scala, you know, Scala, Spark's written in Scala. It's Scala, the advantage of Scala is that you, when you, for, uh, for everything new developed with Spark, it'll come in Scala, available Scala first. Um, SQL, I don't know why that's there. You should take that out. But Python um, is another language which is growing in usage. If you look over year over year, Scala is going down. R is new, but it's starting to grow. And then Java is decreasing. Java is the, the harder one. Uh, there's more lines of code. So, so what this is telling us is that if you look at the usage, it's around the growth is around Python and R. And, and this is where the data science workload or data science use cases is coming to Spark. And then the uh, Spark library usage. So data frames is, is taking off like crazy. And that's, again, ideal for that data science workload. And then you got SQL, uh, streaming, so they're all on the increase. And then machine learning is also increasing as well. And this is the uh, survey that was done to see what APIs are being used in production. Um, I expect next year you'll see uh, machine learning to grow more. So IBM is betting big on that Spark. So, so we have invested in the Spark Technology Center, which we've put, I think, about 100 engineers there to to do nothing but contributing to Apache Spark. Uh, we also use Spark in our portfolio. 
Um, so not, well, not only are we contributing to Spark, you know, we don't just do that because we're, you know, we, we like Spark. We're doing it because we are setting uh, a lot of, Spark. we're putting a lot of Spark in our tools and our applications. Watson uses Spark. Uh, our, some of our health applications use Spark. So um, even our security applications use Spark under the cover. So we're using Spark a lot. So we're contributing quite a bit. Everything we do, we put out into the open source community. Um, and we also help our clients use Spark if they want to just you know, use Spark themselves. And when we created, created the Spark Technology Center, uh, Ben Horowitz, who's the big VC guy, said it was like Spark just got blessed by the Enterprise Rabbi. It's pretty funny. But in, and so SDC continues to grow. And it's just to really show that we're committed. If you look at our contributions to Apache Spark, we're, we're really contributing heavily around uh, machine learning, Spark SQL. I mean, we IBM created Spark SQL. We have a lot of mind share out there. So we've been growing Spark SQL, machine learning, and PySpark, which is the Python in, incorporating Python uh, capabilities within to Spark at the you know for distributed. So those are the areas we focused in on, and R is becoming uh, another hot uh, area that we're doing a lot of contributions. And, you know, Databricks, the founding company, they have most of the committers there. So they have, you know, uh, Matei, who's kind of the guy who invented Spark at Amp Labs, which we support Amp Labs. So they do a lot of contributions. You know, you, we're not going to beat those guys. But um, I actually got lucky once. I have a selfie with Matei. I was on a, I was like on a flight, and uh, I was flying from Boston to Tampa. I live in Tampa. And then all of a sudden this guy comes down, this skinny guy sits right next to me, and and I'm like, man, he looks familiar. And I'm thinking, I'm like, I started talking to him. And I go, he goes, oh, yeah, I'm in distributed co you know, compute data science and all this stuff. And he goes, I'm like, data breaks? He goes, yeah, I'm Matei. It's like he's the founder, creator of Spark. It felt like a groupie. I'm like, I'm, lear I'm doing nothing but learning Spark lately. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. But he's a nice guy. And um, data breaks is a partner with IBM. So we work with them um, on a lot of projects particularly you know, GPU acceleration with our R&D. We've done kind of quite a bit with those guys. So we're number two in contributions behind Databricks. But then if you look at all the rest, I mean, we, we have more contributions in the next five companies. And this, actually, these five, six companies here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven companies make up 70% of all the contributions to Apache Spark. 2.0. So, and the other thing I would make note is, you know, we're heavily invested in machine learning. We have been doing machine learning quite a while, and so we're, we're contributing a lot in that space. And um, SQL and, and um, R, and as well as Python. So Spark has been accel it's accelerated machine learning. And here's some of the reasons why. You know, Spark is easy. You know, um, you, you can code solutions much faster with Spark. There's less lines of code. Um, there's multiple programming languages, so you can have a Python person get up to speed quite quickly. You can also get Java people up to speed quickly. Um, Spark's also agile, and I look at that typo in there. Quickly, you can build pipelines quickly, and um, it's got a unified API library that is accessible uh, and easy to use. And it supports notebooks, which make it even more usable. And then Spark's really fast. You know, you can iterate um, and train models quicker. I should have proofread this. And then uh, <laughs> in-memory processing at uh, scales, you know, it's, it's just it's much faster. That lazy evaluation I talked about, optimized compute. So there's been, I'm telling you, the market right now around machine learning, if you're a developer and you want to get into data, data science space, start to play with machine learning because it's just everybody's looking at machine learning right now. So what is machine learning? You know, I was a programmer, so for me, I programmed everything explicitly. So machine learning is really, uh, you know, the use of data to where you can have computers acting without things being explicitly programmed. You're just using a formula. So it's really just a, a, a you know, you guys probably all know this, but uh, sometimes it's good to talk about so people understand it. And then the process to create a machine learning model, this is kind of the standard basic way to do it, but, you know, it's, it's all about you bring your data in, you know, you cleanse and transform your data, then you, you train a model, you build you out some of that data as a train, you have a, some of that data for test and cross-validation to get an error rate, and then you run it against the algorithm, you train that data for a predictor field, so you're really trying to identify, you identify one field that says, hey, here's all my data, here's one field, I'm trying to see what algorithm, how accurate it is to predict it. So 
It trains to get that algorithm against 80% of your data and then 10% of your data, or you can pick any amount, 70%, 60% of your data, but you train your data against there and, and you try to build that model and then you validate and test it and get an error rate. So, so it's quite basic model and, and the reason I'm going through this is because we've been putting together uh, application uh, development interfaces to let people do this simply so that they can quickly embrace machine learning and build a, an endpoint that they can quickly deploy, which I'll show you guys. So the data scientist, while it's the sexiest job, it's also one of the toughest jobs right now. I've known a lot of guys who get hired and quickly quit and go to another place because it's just the, a lot of the problem is more than just the data scientist. So there's the tool sets, you know, there's, there's so many tool sets out there, so it's really difficult for them to be uh, successful and their approach is really limited by the tools that the companies kind of embraced and, and used at the, and, and which has been a challenge. You have fragmented and time consuming um, um, a disjointed environment, so everything kind of takes forever to get your stuff together. And then your analytic silos, which you know you have different organizations that have different data sets, and it's hard to bring that together. So, so data scientist has a tough job. So here comes the sales part. So, so our mission is really to make data and analytics simple and accessible to all. So that we've built this thing called the Watson Data Platform, and in there we built a data science experience, which I'm going to uh, show you a demo of. And data science experience is really a, a collaborative space that lets you um, learn about data science, particular algorithms, Python libraries. You can create different analytical assets or, or different uh, you know, uh, analysis, and then you can collaborate with other data scientists. So it's, it's a pretty cool uh, environment. And what it does is it really brings together three things, community, which is um, the place for tutorials, data sets, and different things about for education. Open source, we bring together you know, Spark, Jupyter Notebooks, um, Python, R, we have R, you know, Shiny uh, and R Studio. And then we added some of our IBM um, products, the capabilities that we've done over the years and things like uh, data shaping and piping UI to simplify the process, uh, auto, data, auto data preparation, um, and advanced visualization. So we kind of pull that all together into one platform. And um, what this has allowed, the, the, what it allows us to do, and, and kind of my, my pitch to you guys is that if you're a developer, you really can become more, uh, more embedded in that team with the data scientists where you can actually all, you know, supplement them and do some capabilities and, and deploy them out into applications without the truly need for that data scientist team. You, you kind of become the data scientist. But I'm not saying, you know, I have had a lot of clients yell at me if I say, you know, we can automate the data, you know, application developers can automate data scientists and everything. No, you can't. So it depends on how you view it. I think really once you begin to learn how to do some of the stuff, you are a data scientist. So it's kind of like back in the day when, I don't know if any of you are old enough, but you remember back in the day when everybody was webmaster? You remember? Everybody was a webmaster. Now everybody's a data scientist. So you're a data scientist. Any questions? I'm going to do a quick demo, or what do you guys got thoughts? I got a hoodie here. You know. how, do you, how do you price this stuff? Do you do it by the volume of data people are putting through it, or is it more complicated than that? Our pricing for the tool? No, it's just uh, so we have a couple ways that we price it. So for companies, we have enterprise license where you have five seats and so much storage is on the cloud, fully managed. You have a 30 node Spark cluster and you just pay so much per month. And then we also have individual plans. Right now it's free, so data science experience, you go out there, it's free, you get like um, a little bit of storage and you could try it out. And we're working on a freemium model and then if you wanna like add more computation and more storage, you kinda just kinda put a credit card in there and it kinda is up by consumption. So we got a few models. And for our big clients, we kinda just give it to them and say, here, pound at it and tell us what you think and so we can grow our product because a, a big part of what we're trying to do is make sure that we get people to use you know this open source technologies and start to embrace it and put it into their applications so we, we're big you know i'm the i'm the global sales leader for this so i i work with om and dev and and driving our, our go to market and um and right now we have quite a few clients using it but we just went to market with it late last year, November, and um, now we're j this end of this month, we're releasing our Watson Machine Learning, which is what I'm gonna demo for you, and some other capabilities. So we're expecting that Q2 and three, we're gonna 
hit quite a few deals that clients are gonna um, right now I got I got I think I got like 40 customers on it so it's grown pretty quick let me show you it so if you, for each of you go to data science experience.com or no it's just it's just uh, it's just uh, sorry data science.ibm.com and you'll go right here to this landing page and you just do sign up and you get a 30-day trial right now and eventually that's going to stay free uh, for education and, and just usage and then as you do more enterprise or, or larger volume projects uh, it'll cost you something but let me just sign in so it's a fully managed environment and when you land into DSX you'll see you, you go to community page and here you can search on articles like I wrote a few labs on Spark. So if you want to uh, learn about Apache Spark, you got Apache Spark Lab One. In here, you can quickly create using PySpark, create some RDDs, some quick transformations and, and actions. It'll teach you about Spark. Uh, but there's also Lab Two right here, which is query. So you Spark SQL, and Lab Three is all about machine learning. So um, um, I recommend you go in there. And in those labs, if you look at them, this it's you'll see it has a little bit of a description, but it also has a notebook, which has all of this uh, um, description, which as well as code in here to show you how to uh, actually code with Spark. So it's a great tutorial. And um, for some of our clients, I'll do them on site too, but uh, you, you don't really need to, you can do it on your own. So let me go back. And you can search on different data sets. Um, so do you have a question? Did you have a question? Oh, yeah. Um, is Spark more for ad hoc analysis, or is it like a reliable, like stable enough with changing inputs um, to work as like a daily workflow? You could, it's very stable to do daily. I mean, a lot of people have Spark in production. Um, you know, but everything's kind of programmed. So you're, you're, you mean, do you, what do you mean by changing input? So if, it, you I think so I, I know what you're talking about. I was going to tell you like that if when you show that workflow, you know, you have a JSON ingest, ingestion in your reply. Yeah. It would go back there. Then you have the processing and then you explain right well quite good how machine learning works, you know, you have a set of variables and you are trying to predict something, either for regression or for filtering. But and then you have the model and then you you do the deployment, you use that model to predict something or to yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can. But that's it. You have to use the model, and you are using it. You have this. You, you are adding new data to the to the environment, so you are actually have to retrain or recreate your model. Yeah. So, so we have. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we we have the capability to set. So the question was, how do you refresh your models so that changing data refreshes to it? So we have intervals that we define where you can um, have it retrain every day or every couple hours. And we're also working on capability. And this is part of the value out of IBM. You know, today with Spark, you'd have to create a Spark submit job and you'd have to rerun it in, every day and, and schedule that as a cron or something. We kind of built some applications around that, but. Um, you also have the cap we're working on capability so as data goes through this in, in real time it can continue to score and, and improve and as well define some alerts that says if it goes out of a certain error rate once we have a, 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 a feedback loop which says hey you know we predicted this but then it ended up being say this value when we get that feedback loop we're going to monitor the error rate and if it goes out of some type of kpi then we'll send an alert because um, this is all about our model management uh, uh, strategy uh, because companies are building models and they're de deploying these endpoints on the platform and then applications are just calling it and and so so we got to keep up with that and monitor them and so we're working on a whole strategy around that and that's all coming out this year um, and I'll show you some of that capability do you want the hoodie okay. it's all extra large though you it's too big for you uh, someone else can have it. all right I did you want you got a question all right. What what was your question? <laughs> My question was more about like um, the volume of data. Oh, so Spark. We I I'm working with companies like General Motors where they have 500 petabytes of data, and we're able to do some Spark jobs. So there's no, it's pretty mature when it comes to dealing with large volumes of data. Um,
Yeah, you can for sure. That's why you got to design your spark cluster for the size of the data that you're kind of going to be dealing with. There is some, so, so is auto, so your cluster manager can manage some of that and spill some of the disk, but you kind of, you can't, you can get memory errors if you blow up a small spark cluster. We, we have some things we've built in there for optimization based on the data science experience so that people don't hit that. And, um, um, but, but yeah, that's still part of it. It's not as mature, I guess, is what you're saying, like a relational data warehouse, which won't let you do anything if you're going to blow it up. Is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. I, I agree with you there. It's it's getting there. The catalyst, which is an optimizer built inside of Spark, allows data frames to be optimized. Um, and when you do Spark code, code in Spark, you stick with data frames, and that catalyst will continue to grow. I think, and, and you'll see it. But it's not a database. It's an application. So just like in C, if you code an application, you could blow it up. I mean, it's like it's really still more of a application than it is a database. That makes sense. All right. So, th so here, let me show you um, everything that we do. For some reason, this because of my resolution, my bars are different. But everything we do is under projects. So, if I go to view projects, um, we've created a space that allows you to create a project and add collaborators. Um, so, like I have a project here, I call it Focus Five Machine Learning in Five Minutes. But I've put in here. Um, a bunch of my, uh, you'll see once you're in the project, it's organized by analytic assets. And this is kind of your notebooks, which I'll show you what they look like. Models and, and uh, flows, which are really SPSS flows. Data assets, which are really data files or data connections that we've kind of organized together here. Bookmarks are really articles. Deployments, these are endpoints that are built to, of like the model that I built that I want to call through an API. And collaborators. Here are folks that I've given them access rights to my project. I created it and I gave editors and viewer access. And then settings. And if you look here, it's just some details around the project, storage that's used, associated services. Like I have a Spark service in the background on our Bluemix platform I use, as well as our IBM Watson machine learning service. And you could even define a service here if you wanted to, like an AWS EMR Spark service. So you have some flexibility. And then you have access tokens is for security, which I don't really deal with a lot. No, I got, we got a whole team that deals with security. <laughs> then you got GitHub integration. And I don't know what this is, to be honest, project scope. But let me go show you something real quick with analytic assets. So, so here, I'm just going to show you. Um, you guys familiar with TensorFlow? Trying to think what notebooks show you. So here is a, a example of deep learning with TensorFlow. So um, this is what a notebook looks like. So when you open up a notebook, you'll see it's a, a space where you can uh, put some documentation as well as do uh, have code in cells. So right here, I can create a code a cell, and let me show you what this looks like um, from scratch. So if I add a notebook. I can create a notebook, and um, and then here I could pick the language. I can do Python, R, Scala, or Python 3.5. I could pick a Spark version. I pick my Spark service, and then I could just create a, a space. And now I've created a Jupyter notebook. And in the background, I have automatically created for me an instance for a Spark cluster, as well as some um, um, Python libraries that are installed and ready to go. And if you can see, the navigation is along the top here. So if I go here, I can say, oh, look, I have, uh, I could load data files in. I can also define connections. But here is a data file. And then I'm going to say, I'm going to take this data file. And I'm just going to go ahead and create, insert a Spark session data frame. And it'll create the code for me. And then if I run this, I've now taken that data file. It's now run against the Spark cluster. You see the asterisk. It'll come back in a minute. And it'll have a data frame available. Um, and you can see the job right here is running Spark job. So it's kind of a cool interface, and it, it allows you to it, you know, kind of iterate back with the Spark cluster as well as your data and do some data science. Um, it's just a Jupyter notebook, but for, for, for those that know it, 
but it kind of adds some simple, easy to use capabilities. The other thing that's nice is if you look here, you'll see um, this is my notebook, but the environment. So I have a Spark environment running that's accessible. So, you know, SC tab, you'll see the Spark context is already available. I don't have to create it, I don't have to connect it. And then here I have all these Python libraries. So I have, you know, uh, SkyKit Learn, I got Matpl Matplotlib, Pandas, they're all available. I could even got pip, so I could do a pip install. And um, I could show you some, for example, like Google's TensorFlow. I'll, on one of my other notebooks, I did a install of TensorFlow, and then I did a, a style transfer, which I can show you what that looks like. Any questions yet so far? No? All right. Let me show you what the style transfer looks like. Is anybody familiar with style transfer and TensorFlow? All right, cool. This one's fun. Um, So here's a deep learning example using the TensorFlow library. And, but really my session's around machine learning. I gotta get to that next before I run out of time. I got 10 minutes. There it goes. The other thing you could do too, I forgot to mention, is you have the capability to share. So I could share some of these. Um, you could also, uh, there's a scheduler, which I have to go back to the other one. And you can create uh, chat like capabilities here. I can add comments so that while I'm sharing. So for example, you create a project. I go in there, I create an analysis as a data scientist, say, I'm trying to figure this out. Somebody else can look at it and say, uh, you could say, I need more data sets. And they're like, OK. And so we can collaborate and share and create checkpoints with the notebooks. So it really creates it like an IDE for data scientists and developers. But here, it, TensorFlow, don't ignore all the code, because I'm going to put that as imports eventually. But uh, basically, it's using a deep learning algorithm to take two pixel images that doesn't know anything about them other than dots. You know, it's a pixel image. And it's saying, okay, using this um, uh, deep learning algorithm, take these two together and let's merge the styles. So, so as you iterate, you see 10 iterations, you start to see the new image that's created just using an algorithm. After 20 iterations, it gets better. And after 30, and 40, and then 50, and then 60 iterations, you'll see. I now have the Incredible Hulk with this style. So I took this image with this style and made that. And I see, you know, a lot of data scientists nowadays are doing really important work like this, like taking a picture of their cat and make it look like an Art Deco and stuff. <laughs> but it's just kind of, a, it's kind of a neat use case here. But let me show you a little more practical. Um, oh, sorry. The other thing nice about DataSense Experience, it really creates a space for you to load data in, create connections, so it's kind of organized your data for you. Um, so I encourage all of you guys to play with it and, and start to learn and do the tutorials. But um, here's, here's what I want to show you. So under your analytic assets, so if you were to code a machine learning model and deploy it, um, you, would have to, you would have to create quite a bit of Spark code. It's not a lot. But you have to create some Spark code. And here's a, uh, a, a notebook that does a prediction of outdoor equipment that we collected through an API you know, of purchases on a website. So um, you'll see here, it kind of, you know, import PySpark. And then you'll, um, and I'm going to go quickly through this. But you create here, you can see the schema of the data. It shows you the records. You have product line, gender, age, marital status, and, and profession. And based on that, we want to do predictions. So then you would create a ML model. So we'd create a model, a few lines of code. We'd have to split that data into 80, 18, and, and 2%. I don't know why they did that. but so and, and then you would train that data and test and validate. And you'd kind of run that against your Spark ML libraries, which are right here, PySpark ML. And, um, and then you can come down and you could print your schema. Let me see here. And you can get your prediction, your accuracy, and error rate. So, so it's more accurate than flipping a coin. It's like 58% accurate, but it's not that great. But anyway, it's just a good way of showing how you can do that. And then you have a way to, with Watson Machine Learning, you can create a deployable endpoint uh, through our services so that you don't have to kind of redeploy the whole application yourself. It simplifies it for you. But let me show you how to do this uh, simply with the GUI. So we've created a way to do this with a GUI. So here um, I can take, and this is a sales predict. So here it's part of the pipeline. This is your pipeline on the left. And you could just pick some sales data. You can drop it in here if you wanted to. 
um, within the data. You can just drop files in, and it becomes accessible. So here I created data, I'm gonna prep it. You'll see it's the same data. I could pick a, a auto data transformer or I could just pick some can transformers. You have quite a bit of them that you can play with. Then I could do train and the way this works is um, you pick a predictor field. I'm kind of not in edit mode, but I'll just talk to it. And then once you pick the predictor field, it gives you, it kind of, a, it tells you an approach. Um, this one says multi-class classification. You pick some estimators, which really are nothing more than just the algorithms available. And we're continuing to grow this. This is right now in beta and it's using all Spark ML. And then here at the bottom, you'll see, you'll say I want to set a 60% train, 20% test, 20% holdout, so it's, you don't have to kind of code that. And then you can go to evaluate and it'll bring you back, it'll train, you run it, it take a couple minutes, and it'll come back and give you the, um, the results of them. And I know it says poor, but again, you get the same error rate, it was the same data. You'll see that that's, that's the uh, best part. Once you get to where you're happy, you click save, and I have one saved here. I'm trying to go fast. So once it's saved, you'll see it says, oh, look, I have a uh, IBM Watson Machine Learning Service product line. I have a random forest uh, with Spark ML classification uh, algorithm available. And then I can do a one-click deployment. Kind of is very simple. Just I want to do an online deployment. And what it does is it'll create you a a REST API that you can access with your applications. So once you have that, you have this scored endpoint that you can call with your applications and it can do predictions for you. And uh, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite powerful and easy to use. And then if you look here, you just do a simple test. So I'll, I'll say, let's say a female age 30, kind of my import puts, single as professional, I run the, uh, the, against the uh, predictor, and it'll say 68% uh, likely to buy personal accessories. I'm like, okay, cool. So let's say if she's married, right? What would she do differently? Predict, and it's less likely to do personal accessories and buy other stuff. So, so it really is a, a cool way for you to just take pure, just data, take it into here. Now, this is in beta. It's coming out here in a few weeks. Yes? Is it possible to upload your own algorithm? Uh, Right. Yeah, we're right now we're using all the Spark ML um, algorithms, but we're working on, there's some projects out there that we can plug in here that we can pull your own algorithms in. But most people use, use the CAN ones right now. Though. Yeah, it would be great for academia, for sure. And um, I'll check, because I know that um, we're, we're adding algorithms to Spark ML. We're also including SPSS algorithms that we have available to us in here that are well known and usable. So we're ex continually expand the algorithms that are available. And then you can just see right here, I actually have a, a GUI. So this is just a dashboard. Shows that here's the um, service. And you know he kind of just showed some customers and generate predictions. And for Alexander, oh, I got to select the deployment. For Alexander, who's a male, 36, single, he'll buy camping equipment. This is all, it's really for an outdoor store is what the data was. It's not a great use case, but it's kind of cool. But this is just an, a simple Node.js application. So with my last minute, any questions? No more hoodies. No more, I'm out of hoodie. I got three in my room. Uh. <laughs> I'll bring them down, I should have brought them down. I, I gotta get room. I gotta go fly to San Francisco Thursday, and I'm doing a briefing in San Francisco. Then I gotta fly all the way back home to Florida to Tampa on my wife's birthday. Saturday is gonna kill me. Your notebook that you showed there, you showed we can put text, we can put code. Like, yep. Like we could even create our own uh, regression algorithms there. Yeah, absolutely. And yes. Well, you could do. There's a couple ways. Most people uh, share notebooks. Like I, I have on GitHub a ton of notebooks, but you can um, when you can download them um, right here into I Python notebooks, and you just hit this download button. And if you'll see, it'll save it as a standard. It's just IPYNB file, which then you can import into any Jupyter notebook. So it's all the open source stuff. 
And you could also share it as a just a, a URL right here that people can look at. And no, you have to take it from HTML to PDF. Um, but you get it. You can send an HTML. The other thing I forgot to show you is that there's a lot of cool visualizations. I forgot to, I promised uh, David he's got a talk tomorrow at 11 <laughs> on Pixie Dust. Pixie Dust is a visualization library. He's going to go much deeper into visualization libraries on uh, in notebooks. But you can see here, here's an example of Brunel. These are these are quite extensive. I mean, you could just build this this lot these visualizations in Jupyter notebooks. Uh, we've actually open sourced the Brunel libraries, which are came out of Cognos. Pixie Dust is another library that we've open sourced, which are visualizations on Jupyter Notebooks. So you can build these visualizations and then share them as HTML pages. So uh, it's quite interesting. And the nice thing about it is you have the code um, and the code that was to generate it as well as together as a visualization of the results. So that's kind of what's the power of, of these notebooks. Um, um, within the uh, this data science experience, and then all of the computation and analysis happens on the back end in the Spark cluster. Did you have another question? No, oh. Yeah, I'm out of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, very much. Thank you guys.